Hello, welcome to Key News. I'm Jim Lesko, the Executive Director of Amherst Media, and today we're going to be talking about fair use, copyright, and what does that have to do with community media centers, and in general, the web and everything else in your life. So tonight, I'm very honored to have with us two guests that have uh, been involved with free speech for many years in the issue of uh, fair use. I, I have here Patricia, or Pat, off, off their Heidi, I apologize, who is the director of the Center for Social Media at the uh, School of Communications at the American University of Washington, D.C. Uh, she's also co-authored recently with Peter Yazzie, uh, Reclaiming Fair Use, How to Put Balance Back in Copyright, University of Chicago Press, July 2011. So this is a brand new book. Uh, she also is um, heads the Fair Use and Free Speech Research Project at the Center. So welcome, Pat. Thank you. Uh, also with us today is Martha Fuentes, who is one of our allies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who's uh, dedicated her life in public policy and communications at looking at community media centers and fair use, and also the issue of franchises and how do we fund these centers. So welcome both of you to uh, Amherst Media, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Pat, I'd like to start with you and just talk a little bit about seven years of working on an issue such as free speech is one admirable and uh, one we, we, we respect and thank you because, as you know, pe peg stations like this, access centers and media centers, were formed to guarantee local access and people's rights to have their voices sure. heard. So I'd like to hear, how's that progressed in that seven years for you? Well, I have to say, and I'm a huge fan of access centers and see them as part of the, the very important mix of public media that people need in their communities. Um, and um, the work that, I, I, that I've done for the last seven years is a small slice of my enthusiasm for people's ability to, to um, be active members of society and to express what needs to be heard by other people. Uh, but I was very, very privileged to uh, get to work with a uh, legal scholar, Peter Yassi, uh, on a project that began small and has really ballooned into something that is now actually a movement. And that is the right of people to exercise their free speech rights under copyright. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that copyright is, uh, is, has free speech aspects. But, uh, and most people think copyright is all about ownership. But right, in fact, yeah. copyright it exists to be able to promote culture. And you really can't do that if, you, if, if the people who already made something, the people who have limited monopoly rights on it, control it completely and forever. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what are those other uh, rights that you have to be able to access other people's copyrighted material, and how can you use them? The biggest right that people have is called fair use. And you actually, even before something falls into the public domain, something that is extant today, uh, a popular film, Transformers, um, a popular TV show, Mad Men, a popular advertisement, whatever it may be, you actually have the right to quote from that material in, in some circumstances. And so the question is, what would be those circumstances and what will happen to you if you guess wrong? Um, so that's what everybody's worried about, right? Exactly. exactly. Um, and in fact, the law permits you uh, to make a recent judgment as you do on all of your free speech rights on a case-by-case -case basis when you quote something. And it, and it really asks only two questions. Did you, are you using this for some new purpose or are you just using it because you like it and you don't want to pay for it? Are you downloading um, a popular song because you just think it's great um, and you want to be able to download it from a free site and then, and then share it with your friends? Or are you um, downloading so either that song or excerpting some aspect of it in order to use it in a different way. Perhaps you're saying, uh, Justin Bieber's really terrible because look at this other guy who's singing. <laughs> Compare the way that they both do this refrain. That would be a critical comment. Uh, supposing you had um, a child in your living room who was dancing to a Justin Bieber song and they were just, it was just caught in the background. Mm -hmm. And the adorable thing is watching this child dance. Okay, that's, um, that's an incidental use that is completely permitted. Um, supposing you want to make a point about media, you want to say Britney Spears' videos are full of product placement. Uh, you have the right to quote that video. Um, you probably don't need all of her video to make that point. You <laughs> right, could probably right. take two or three examples or even screenshots uh, to make that point. And mm -hmm. so your question about your fair use rights there would be, what am I trying to do that's different than the original? 
and how much do I need? Sometimes you need 100%. You're making a comment, for instance, on you're teaching a class on mise-en-scene in photographs and how photographs are, are, are often framed in a way that reflects classical painting. You want to picture the classical painting, you want to picture the photograph, they're both 100%. On the other hand, they're not at a high resolution, right. and nobody's going to be, you're not using them for their original purpose. So that kind of logic is really the core logic of fair use, and it's not very hard to do. It's very easy to see the difference between a fair use and, say, what the whole industry is worried about, which is downloading. And uh, if I understand correctly from talking with you and others, that uh, our network news use it all the time. They, it's one of their, their greatest sins, if you will, or thrills when they get to use it because where are their sources coming from, correct? Broadcast news is just chock full of unlicensed copyrighted material that they use without even thinking about it. Journalists never even say to themselves, well, I'll employ fair use. They're just like, oh, I have a right to that. Um, and actually, um, you know, Viacom is a major company and it produces the Colbert uh, Report and, and The Daily Show, and they are just chock full of <laughs> copyrighted material that they never pay for. And so I always like to say, if it's good enough for Viacom, it's good enough for you. <laughs> um, and I want and to Martha, add, yeah, yeah um, one of the things about this work uh, that uh, Pat has led you know, at the Center for Social Media, is so important for us because it comes out of uh, grounded research with community of practitioners. And uh, I'm just curious to know, um, and communities of practitioners like uh, school teachers and filmmakers uh, and documentary producers and so forth, um, I'm curious to know, basically, in your work with them, what have you found first to be a challenge? I mean, to understand, uh, appropriate, and practice for use. And uh, what comes as, uh, you know, a, a, um, if you want a gain or, or something attained through this process of self reflection and, and understanding where the rights of, of the producer are? I love that question because uh, one of the thrills of this work is that it really depends on very good. Uh, research. And so academics are actually really important in this. At the same time, academic work means nothing if people don't use the material. And so we have those two sides going on. And the, the reason why we needed to work with practitioners goes back to something I said to Jim just now, which is that people are scared to use this. They want to know what bad thing will happen to them mm -hmm. if they guess wrong, and they use maybe too much. Uh, recently, by the way, I want to recommend to everybody that they go to rebelliouspixels.com or you can Google uh, too many dicks on the Daily Show. Um, <laughs> okay. There is a popular song called Too Many Dicks and it's about too many dicks on the dance floor and it's about a, a situation where a guy goes to a dance and there's, there are not enough girls. Um, but many people have taken up this song to, as an overlay song to, to provide critique in other situations. And Jonathan McIntosh, who's a brilliant remixer, I uh, recently took 100 excerpts from 100 different jo um, John Stewart shows, daily shows, wow. um, and edited them together to be paced to the song to make a point that the daily show is heavy on men commentators and light on women. Sure. It's absolutely Great. hilarious. Yeah. But um, the, the, um, the question that people have when they try to do something like Jonathan is, oh, wow, I'm, I'm picking up Viacom material. How is Viacom mm -hmm. going to feel about that? Somebody might have ever heard about a cease and desist letter. A cease and desist letter frequently says, you're using our copyrighted material, that's infringement, and you could be subject to penalties of up to $150,000 per infringement which I don't know if that sounds terrifying to you. It certainly sounds terrifying to me. It's probably completely bogus, but, but nonetheless, it's a letter that a came threat. on letter, letterhead. Yeah. And you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, another area where people get scared is they put something up on YouTube and they think they have a right to do that. They may even think they have a fair use right to do it. And preemptively, YouTube removes it because of a takedown notice, which happened because of automatic detection no person was ever involved. Mm -hmm. And then they get this really scary notice that says, you can dispute this, but if you do, we will now, you will now be subject to potential 
um, lawsuits by this other company. Now, all of that is legitimately completely fear-inducing. And there's no real great body of law to guide you either mm -hmm. because nobody really sues much on this stuff. So what are you going to do? You're going to have to figure out what your community needs to do to achieve its mission. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to need to get together with other people in that community and decide where you need it. What are the situations that come up most mm -hmm. often? And what's fair and what isn't to use other people's copyrighted material within the law? Because the law is legitimately and appropriately very vague and flexible. Mm -hmm. It says we're not telling you when you can use fair use and when you can't. We're saying decide that on the basis of what you need to do in order to create new culture. Well, that's all very well and good, except with those terrible infringement mm -hmm. penalties. You're worried until you know where the safety zone is in your community. And so we worked with a bunch of people, including, and thank you for mentioning it, documentary filmmakers, uh, teachers, uh, uh, English teachers mostly, K uh, media literacy teachers, people who make online video, and actually seven other groups. And in each case, what we did was to go in before we ever um, asked them to work together to shape a code, what we said is, how are you thinking about copyright now? And what are the problems that you have? And we did long form interviews with them. We listened very carefully. We, and, and people often, often in many different circumstances said, we don't have any problems in this area. We really don't, we don't, we don't suffer, uh, we're not, we're not, um, we're, n we're not seeing projects stopped. And you say, why? And they say, well, the documentary filmmakers say, well, we, we, we avoid any films that have anything to do with music or <laughs> <Okay>. movies or, <laughs> or <laughs> political affairs because we'd have to be dealing with television and, and don't do anything funny. You know? yeah. And then the teachers say, well, I sneak the material into my classroom so that principal doesn't notice and the librarian will never find out. I shut the door and I hope the students won't tell right. anybody, <laughs> which, by the way, is, is inhibiting learning. <laughs> Um, or they say, well, you know, what I do is just what the, I only get stuff out of the library. And the, unfortunately, everything in the library is around 10 years old, so I can't teach any current media yeah. to the students. Can't offer them any media literacy of anything they would actually watch. Um, so we found many deforming practices where people, long before anybody would get to them, long before they would set up, set up a counter takedown notice or anything, long before that, way deep in the recesses of their mind, they're going, oh, maybe not. Oh, uh, no, mm -hmm. don't think so. So that's what, when we showed the communities the research where we said, you know, your biggest problem is you. You're just not sure. And you're not, you're, you're not, you're not being irrational here. Yeah. You're scared because you don't know what's normal. Let's, let's brainstorm a code together. So that's what we did. So, for instance, the documentary filmmakers have many, they have four typical situations. Mm -hmm. One of them is, well, I want to talk about this media. I want to make a comment that, out Fox, uh, that Fox Television is not ex actually fair and balanced. And I'm, and I'm willing to show that by showing three different clips of how Fox covers something. Well, Fox is not going to give Robert Greenwald permission. No to yeah. license its material. He had to use fair use. What, that's one example of the four. What, what about teachers? Well, one set of problems teachers had was what material can I use in the classroom and virtual classrooms? And what material can I build into my curriculum? Yeah. But other questions were like, what can I ask my students to do? S their students were making video in the classroom that was p media literacy work in itself. But then the teachers would say, we'd like to show this in class assembly. And that would have left the four walls of the classroom and it would have lost its educational exemption. And the principal would say, well, we can't show your work in assembly and we can't show mm -hmm. it on our closed circuit television because it's not a classroom much less being able to post it on YouTube yeah. or entering it into any one of the many contests that students can get ready We're putting well. on the educational mm -hmm. channel, the public educational government cable for, station for education. For instance. <laughs> and of course, the teachers, on, you know, in order to <coughs> let them do that, they're going to have to teach the students their rights. They're, yeah. they're no longer going to be able to say to the students, well, you just make whatever you want, honey, and it'll be creative. They're going to have to say, look, here's the, here's the, the principle of fair use that you're employing, and here's the limitation on that principle. And this is, as far, this is how far you should go, but then there are also, you have to respect other people's rights, too. So here's the zone of comfort for you. And so they've been able, documentary filmmakers have yeah. been able to distribute films that they never could 
put on, on television before. Teachers have been able to circulate w their own work and their students' work in a way they haven't, because now they know what's normal, right. what's acceptable, what's, what's not going to get me in trouble. And now they have something to take to their principal when their principal says, well, we can't do that. And they have something to take to the awards committee that said everything has to be cleared in this video. You know? And should an access provider, unlike you, Jim, be un unfamiliar with mm -hmm. their rights of fair use, they could take this to them and say, you see, we did this according to the law. Well, I really appreciate your, your um, booklets and also I'm looking forward to reading the new book because we're constantly, you know, we're under FCC on our cable side and everyone, that gets a little scary about what, you know, who's going to be looking and, and how, they're, how formal they're going to be on that. But yet to date, while I'm here, we've never been challenged. And, you know, and at times you, you question. So this is very useful for us to put out to our producers and explain to our producers of like, don't be afraid. You know, here's your rights and, and let's understand it. So we expect to be doing more workshops on this with our, our producers and with the community. We did PSAs with this local school, uh, the middle school, where we were teaching about <clears throat> fair use, but through creative commons and being, and now we have a, a way of discussing it at another level too. So I'm very excited about that for those teachers. I mean, they have to overcome firewalls within schools and other, you know, like how do you even bring down the material that these yeah. kids can get on their mobile devices while you're sitting there with your computer unable to attach it to anything. So, I mean, there's a lot of um, yeah. education that needs to go on from our side. And Martha, on the academic side, do you, or through the community media that you're researching through yeah. the academic side. What do you well, find? Well, I think that there is a lot of relevance for all this work. Uh, I mean, in our work recently, looking at anchor institutions, for instance, in the broadband and how technology is being used and talking to teachers and actually administrators, IT administrators, they probably not clear about these issues at all. So actually it's not just for teachers, but as school administrators. And a school administrator is not just the principal, but actually uh, IT, the IT component, correct? Um, which uh, I, I see great potential for these to inform actually broadband policy <laughs> in, in terms of adopt the best practices in adoption, correct? I mean, if we want to uh, create, uh, foster these creative communities here in Western Mass, mm -hmm. for instance, or elsewhere. So um, it's, there is, now uh, you mentioned that uh, in the book, I mean, talking about uh, fair use, uh, how actually contextual could be. Can you explain us what is the idea of, you know, con how context plays a role in interpreting fair use practices? You know, yes, but I'd love to do that because it's a common, common mistake about fair use that they, people want to know what the rules are. How much can I use? Yeah. And they have been helped by a lot of well-meaning people who have mm -hmm. tried to reduce for particular circumstances um, fair use to a, a certain set of rules, like, the, the, the broadcasters always said, oh, 30, se 30 seconds is right, fine, right. which actually for news is, is probably a decent rule of thumb for them. I wouldn't, I mm -hmm. wouldn't go there, but okay. But, or uh, if you're quoting from um, book material, sometimes people will say, oh, 400 words. 401? No, got to be 400. <laughs> and in fact, fair use is a free speech right. So it's like all the other free speech rights. Mm -hmm. It's always contextual. You know, you can be penalized for, a, use, for abuse of any of your other free speech rights, um, just like you can with, can with fair use. But most people are not very worried. They're not terribly worried that they are going to run afoul of an, an indecency charge when they're talking about um, uh, um, reproductive education because they are fully aware that there's a certain body of language around mm -hmm. reproductive education that is appropriate and that will not move into the area of indecency. That's because they know what their norms are. So you get an understanding of what's normal in the rest of your free speech rights and you automatically, without thinking about it, contextualize your uses. You are comfortable saying things mm -hmm. in, an, in a comedy club that you are not, never going to say in church. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> I'm sorry, you caught me on that one. That was, that was a good one. I like that. I'm going to use that again. Okay. But um, the, the same thing is true of fair use, that you ask yourself, well, why am I taking somebody else's mm. stuff? Am I do I have a reason other than I just want, don't want to pay them? Well, I think that's an interesting point because with especially young people that we're working with and we're seeing come through the, the center 
is that they're so used to just downloading and using things. This world, I think the confusion is, if I understand it, people think when you say fair use that you're getting around something, that you're somehow you're avoiding the yeah. copyright. Rather, mm -hmm. it's reinforcing not only free speech, but that copyright's uh, legitimate ownership of that. So can you speak to that a little bit? Oh, I'll tell you. You know, there's four words that drive me crazy. Get away with it. People are constantly saying to me, yeah. I, I'm thinking of doing this. Do you think I can get away with it? And I'm like, you know, since when do you ask that about your other rights? <laughs> right. You know, and you should never be saying about fair use, can I get away with it? Because once you think you're sneaking around and getting away with something, maybe you should ask yourself, why do you think you, you, you're dishonoring that person's material? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, they don't have an absolute lock forever and ever on their material. If you want to say something about them, if you want to re refer to this in some new context, if you want to use it in a transformative way to teach people or uh, help them learn, all of those are transformative and you actually have an affirmative right to do that and they do not have any right to complain. So it's not like they have a chair and you took their chair. Mm -hmm. It's not even like they had a virtual chair and you took a copy of their virtual chair. It's like they have limited rights over their material that you have to honor, and you have limited rights over their material that they have to honor, even if they don't know it. Sometimes you have to tell them. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. In Although I will point out that, 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 that you never need to let anybody know that you fair use their material. It's, uh, it's a very polite thing to do to tell people where you got that material. Exactly. That's basic etiquette. A tribute to the Then everybody the knows or, that you yeah. don't think it's yours. Or the lower third explain where the source is. I mean, Or definitely. put it in the end of the yeah. credits or put it in a footnote or that's what academics do, right? They quote each other's mm -hmm. work and then they put it in a footnote. I got it from this place. Yeah, that, that's a historical way of looking at it. Martha? Yeah, I, I just must say that um, for, I mean, for academics, it's more about also learning and teaching also our students how to speak and uh, to, about these issues and how to practice uh, them, correct? Um, what would you say is like a, the next step for us, like in academia, to get um, the, the, like best practices known, to not just for academics, but in the larger community, the action that we can get maybe uh, through community media stations and so forth? You know, I think w in 2004 when we began this, people kind of said, said to us, oh, you're like working on some Band-Aid issue that's <laughs> not really very important. Um, you know, what we need is total copyright reform. Now, copyright, I believe, is, is profoundly unbalanced, and it's been unbalanced since 1976. Laws have been passed yeah. that extend copyright, that give people many more derivative rights, that make it harder uh, for people to access that material. That's all true. But at, this, at the same time, we really need to rediscover this. We've, we, at the center and with these important 10 communities, we've actually proven that this is not a Band-Aid. This is an important right. The more you use it, the bigger it the gets. Bigger it's a muscle. Space, yeah. You have to exercise it. You use it or you lose it. These communities all have success stories. Insurers now accept fair use claims of documentary filmmakers for the first time in 20 years. They, they need errors and omissions insurance. You know, when insurers accept these claims, th they're humorless. They don't, all they're interested in is risk. If there's no risk for them, there's no risk. So we have very successful stories. Now comes mm -hmm. the part where people need to build this in to practice. We've moved it from, it's, we've pioneered mm -hmm. it. It's been a demonstration project. It's great. Okay, now we need to build it. And so I'm looking at libraries. Okay. I'm looking at that code of best practices that we will release in January with the Association of Research Libraries. And I'm thinking research and academic libraries everywhere have a really important role to play. They can, they can do tutorials. They mm -hmm. are the copyright experts for the institutions. When they do those tutorials, they will also spread those to other libraries and to other um, and, to, and to other units. What can teachers do? Well, I, there are two major communities that have already developed codes mm -hmm. of best practices for academics. One is communication scholars and one is film scholars. And other communities can both learn what they did and derive good practices for themselves, but they might also want to say, well, biologists have particular issues. We want to clarify what what our issues are. And to do that, you do that in a biology association. But the other thing is that we can teach our students both by modeling good practices mm -hmm. and by creating assignments that actively encourage them 
to employ copyrighted material creatively. Many people say, well, I don't like my students to copy. And I don't like if film students, for instance. I don't want my students just to use other people's material. I want them to do something original. And it would be great if people could see the manipulating and analyzing and mm -hmm. critical use of existing material as a creative practice. So mm -hmm. those are all just some things to do. But I think the big challenge is to build this knowledge into, into in ongoing the, institutions. Yeah, could you clarify for us, I mean, like the, um, the relation that Creative Commons may have to fair use practices and how they could work together? Absolutely. The work that people are doing on open access is terrifically important. And Creative Commons is a, a license that you as a creator can take out that says, I'm going to make it easier for other people to copy it, mm -hmm. copy this material and use it in any way they want to. And that's, that's all really admirable. Fair use is a way of expanding access to copyrighted material in a different way. Creative Commons is when you, the creator, use those yeah. strong and unbalanced copyright rights to be able to impose new terms, right. more flexible right. terms. Fair use is when you, the user, come in and say, I want to use something that people did in Creative Commons. I want access to that material. Maybe somebody wrote a Creative Commons license that's too narrow for me, and I'm going to need to fair use some of their material. Maybe it's Viacom's material. Maybe it's NBC Universal's material. It's going to be somebody who didn't say already, I can use that, mm -hmm. and I still need it, and I have a legitimate right to it. So there are two techniques mm -hmm. that work together toward a common goal of making copyright more flexible in a regime where it currently is, is, isn't as flexible as it actually needs to be. Now, the, I, I, I think that actually I would love, if I were, if I were king, I could <coughs> rewrite the copyright law to be much more flexible. Unfortunately, I think touching copyright law right now, doing legislative reform, would bring into the scene very, very powerful um, corporate media actors who would yeah. make it even worse. Mm -hmm. Can I just add, um, ask a quick question as we're starting to uh, wind down here? Is, and then maybe it's not a quick question or unfair, but the, the whole question of intellectual property. For instance, we're asked a lot of times to record a poet or a, a lecture that's coming through the valley, through the academic settings. And, they, and we approach because we have to get permission to, to put that image in and record that image, that person's image. Whereas people sitting in an audience might just take out their phones and record it and put it up on YouTube before we even pack our bags to come back. Where, where does fair use work in, that, in those kind of situations? Does the provider of the in intellectual property feel put upon? I mean, do you, have you addressed this at all as far as the individual? You mean what happens when somebody takes your stuff? Yeah, I mean that you're out there whether you're a performer or you're a, a lecturer and that is what you're making your money on and going around and doing. You have rights, yeah. at, you know, and you have great rights under the law and, and you can really hurt other people who use your stuff. Um, yeah. So you, you can just decide which level of enforcement you want to bring to somebody who is clearly infringed. Somebody who took their cell phone and filmed public access television and then put it up on YouTube would probably not get a very nice quality anyway. So I'm, they, I don't know how many people they're going to get to watch in any case. But let's say, they, let's say somebody went to a concert mm. and you know, filmed the, the famous performer, they, Beyonce. And th they put Beyonce's um, entire concert right. on YouTube in pieces. Um, that would be infringement. That would be a very clear infringement. Um, and they would, they would suffer a, a variety of penalties. They, among other things, they would get, probably get a strike from YouTube, and they only need several of those before their, their so account dies. But, but supposing you went to be, uh, the Beyonce concert, and you're all excited about the fact that this ticket was really hard to get. And you put 15 seconds of the Beyonce concert on your Facebook page because you want to tell all your friends, mm -hmm. it's true, I was really there. Look, <laughs> picture of me, picture of Beyonce. Whoa, whoa. You know, <laughs> that actually is a fair use. You are making a document of, of uh, recording an, an, a, an a fact mm -hmm. that you want to demonstrate in, in video. And Beyonce really has no, no case against that. And she that. does get enough on her own, her coverage Probably. out there in the world of her own, and probably makes enough money. But I do raise that because as we, and media centers, we're constantly asked, we're brought in different materials and different sources. As Martha, as you work at the mm -hmm. university, you're constantly 
constantly looking at, at the, your students and how they're perceiving their rights to other people's yeah. uh, material. So uh, I want to thank you, Pat, for not only uh, being here today with us. I know we're going to be videotaping a lecture that you're giving later today at UMass and, and to open up the Open Access Week being celebrated here and across the country. We look forward to seeing your book and c congratulations and looking forward to working with you more closely. Martha, as always, a pleasure to have you here and thank, thank you for you. your support thank of you. all the access centers across the country. This is Jim Lesko for Key News. Please uh, stay in tune, get involved, and become active. Thank you.